Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webcast, The Future of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Pay Data Reporting and the California Equal Pay Act. This webcast is sponsored by Trusaic. This webcast is pre-approved for HRCI credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. You will receive an email from hr.com within two business days. It will include the certification credit information. You can also log into hr.com and go to your View My Credits page where you can see the credits that you have received. If you have any questions during the webcast, click on Q&A in your webinar controls and type them in. I would like to introduce our presenters for today. First, Joanna Kim Bruneni, Esquire, is Vice President of Regulatory Affairs. Joanna, a former partner with Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer and Feld, has over 20 years of experience advising clients on a wide range of employment, tax, intellectual property, and other related business issues. Joanna holds a BSc degree in chemical engineering from University of California, Berkeley, and JD from Loyola, Loyola Law School with honors. She was president of the Korean American Bar Association, Rising Star, Super Lawyers, co-chair of various subcommittees under the American Bar Association and the Los Angeles County Bar Association. Our next presenter is Mark Dwyer, PhD. Mark is vice president of data science for Trusaic. He is responsible for evolving Trusaic's data consolidation processes as the company continues to scale and expand its robust data and analytic solutions. Mark has a PhD in economics from the University of Rochester, an MA in finance from the Wharton School, and a BA in physics from the University of Pennsylvania. He has been affiliated with the American Economic Association, the Econometric Society, and the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. And now over to Joanna. Thank you. Um, so for our discussion today, to understand California's new pay data reporting law, it's important to understand the backdrop, including the international and federal backdrop the trends in state law that ultimately culminated into California pay data reporting. We're then going to go over the nuts and bolts of California pay data reporting, uh, also known as SB 973, and what that data that is being reported reveals in terms of uh, your organization's pay equity status. Okay, next slide. So California pay data reporting is designed to address two issues. One of those two issues is the gender pay gap. Uh, everyone's familiar with it and it's become increasingly uh, in the mind of people over the last few years. This gender pay gap um, or gender wage gap uh, is most you know simply illustrated by the two the two charts to the right there. Um, this is uh, basically from the Pew Research Center median hourly wages of US women uh, as a percentage of men's median, um, just workers in general over 16, we're looking at 85 cents to the dollar. So every um, 85 cents a woman makes, a man makes a dollar. And uh, for a narrower subset, the wage gap is narrower, 89 cents to the dollar, but it's still there. Okay, um, also with regard to non-binary, when we're talking about gender pay gap, it's gonna be relevant. Uh, for California pay data reporting, but to date we don't have enough data collected concerning pay discrimination involving non-binary gender. Next slide. Okay, so as I said, there were two issues. The second issue is the racial pay gap. And that one, uh, you know, there's the, it's both from a race as well as ethnicity. You'll see on this chart, uh, for example, um, this is a chart from Payscale. It was a 2019 survey collected over almost 2 million profiles over a two-year period. And you'll see that the uh, wage gap uh, as compared to a white male, um, you know, it, it fluctuates um, from 87 cents for black Americans um, and for Asians apparently it's a dollar 15 so more than um, the average white man so this is over you know a two-year period and you'll see that there the uh, wage gap depends on the specific race at issue okay next slide so we talked about the gender gap we talked about the wage gap well what 
not surprisingly they found is when you compound the two, the gap gets worse. And um, this particular chart over here is an example dealing with certain frontline occupations. And you'll see that um, depending on the occupation, you know, there's variance. Um, but at the end of the day, they're all, uh, the gap is significant. Uh, and this is from the National Women's Law Center um, that was conducted back in uh, October 2020. Okay, next slide. Uh, one of the things that um, a lot of studies have found, including the Economic Policy Institute back in 2019, is the race gap between black and white workers is the most severe and persistent, and importantly, the, this gap is only getting worse, which may surprise some people. So you've got this chart on the right um, that has three data points from 2000, 2007, 2019, and you see that the gap is actually getting worse no matter how you slice it. Whether, you know, there's different statistical ways of looking at it, different types of cohorts, but regardless, it's all, uh, the gap is getting worse. Okay, next slide. Now, so we're talking about all of these gaps, uh, wage gaps, but those are wage gaps by specific job classifications. So for any given job, uh, you know, what is the wage gap between men and women? There is an overlay on top of that, which is the sort of DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion overlay. And what that overlay is really talking about is, okay, for a given job position, maybe uh, there's no wage gap. In other words, for associates, for example, men and women are paid equally. But what is not being considered is that the lower paid positions are predominated by women. Um, and this is, uh, per, you know, this is, this chart is, you know, example dealing with gender, but um, that there's a chart probably just as, uh, you know, the same kind of chart if you look at it from a race standpoint. And so in addition to the pay gap um, that's going on for a particular, you know, gender comparison or race comparison, you also have to look at whether or not there's, you know, um, representation in the higher paid positions or, or equal uh, representation in the different types of positions based on uh, compensation. Okay, so those are the kind of, uh, that's the background of the issue. Next slide. Now, what's happened is on an international scale, um, the focus has been mostly to reduce the gender pay gap, although at least with uh, so far, the UK is taking under or advisement with regard to the gender, uh, I'm sorry, the race uh, pay gap. You'll see that um, internationally, really just since 2017, there's been a number of legislative actions and pending uh, proposals where um, the government is getting involved to try to reduce um, the pay gap. So you've got UK, Iceland, Switzerland, France, Spain, Germany, Ireland, Canada, and uh, you know, in this sort of international backdrop, what you see is, uh, you know, uh, ways to deal with a pay, uh, pay gap ranging from public shaming, that's the UK model where uh, employers of a certain size have to post their pay gaps um, on their website for all to see. Um, and then there are other models like Iceland which requires you to actually achieve pay equity and get certified uh, by you know a third party kind of certification center. Um, every three years. And then you've got Germany, which is right now, it's pending, where they are requiring um, a certain amount of uh, gender representation um, in uh, certain executive positions. So you, you see kind of uh, countries uh, internationally taking very different approaches, but all designed to address the bottom line, the wage gap, whether it's race or gender. Okay, next slide. So let's go back um, to the U.S. and, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, COVID has been raging, not, you know, just obviously the U.S., but just focusing on the uh, U.S., we talked about the gender and race pay gap, and what we see is COVID has really exacerbated the problem. And unlike the economic downturn of 2008, you know, by all studies, they, they've determined, you know, they have predicted that there will be a continuing loss of uh, jobs for women and people of color. And here's a number of studies that were done talking about how um, the, the COVID has really exacerbated these, uh, these gaps. Okay, 
And uh, next slide. And uh, as a result of this, what lawyers not surprisingly are predicting is an explosion of employee related claims to COVID. So that's something, you know, that we're concerned about coming down the pike with uh, COVID exacerbating, um, you know, race and uh, gender wage gaps in in view of the economic realities of layoffs and furloughs um, that's going to create significant risks for employers okay next slide so on the federal level what have we what were the laws that have been around dealing with pay discrimination well, there's 1963, the Equal Pay Act, that's only for gender, and then 1964, the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which added um, not just gender, but also race and ethnicity. And, uh, you know, under both these laws, the general uh, concept is that, um, that employers need to pay uh, equal wages to uh, their employees, um, that are performing jobs that require substantially equal skill, effort, and responsibility and are performed within the same establishment under similar uh, conditions. And importantly, there are four justifications for pay discrimination. That's whether it's gender or race. And those four justifications are seniority, merit system, system which measures earnings by quantity, quality, or production. Basically, like if someone gets paid by the number of widgets processed, for example. Um, and then there's this fourth factor, this differential based on any factor other than sex. And it is this fourth factor that, you know, since 1963 has created the largest gap in enforcement. Okay, there's a couple of additional changes. Uh, uh, additions since uh, 1964, Civil Service uh, Reform Act of 1978, which add a uh, focus on federal employers, 1991 Civil Rights Act that uh, increased the type of um, uh, awards for, you know, whether it's compensatory, punitive damages that uh, for certain types of discrimination. But yet now, over 50 years later, wage gaps persist for women and people of color. Okay, next slide. So in addition to that federal law, uh, you know, both with respect to the Equal Pay Act and um, Title, uh, Title VII, we also have the Equal Opportunity, uh, sorry, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC. And this administrative overlay um, basically uh, is designed to, you know, basically uh, eliminate unlawful employment discri discrimination. As I noted, notwithstanding that, to date, you know, it's still there. Um, what the EEOC did as one of the means to combat this is create this thing called EEO1 uh, reporting. And what that is is really just collecting workforce, gender, and race, ethnicity, demographics. That's the EEO1 component one reporting. Um, however, um, back in 2016, under the Obama administration, they created this component two reporting. And this will ultimately show to be um, basically the, the, uh, the map of how SB 973 came to being. So this component two reporting uh, was supposed to get started um, uh, sometime around 2017. However, uh, with the change in administration to the Trump administration, um, that was halted, and as a result, there was some litigation, and uh, after a lot of litigation, um, that California Component 2 pay data reporting was required, but only for 2017 and 2018. Um, however, now with the, with the new Biden administration, um, component two, uh, you know, may very well be reinstated. We shall see. So that component two reporting only happened for 2017 and 2018. Okay, next slide. So kind of about the same time frame as the Obama administration adding in this component to basically pay, pay data reporting, about the same time a number of states had started looking for other ways to achieve pay equity. Um, so uh, among the many ways, one way was to expand the definition of substantially similar or comparable work. Essentially, rather than looking at pay discrimination as sort of a hard line equal pay for equal uh, work, it was more like equal pay for 
comparable work, substantially similar work, so that the cohort that um, you know, a, a person alleging discrimination could be broader uh, and it tended to be more pro-plaintiff. And the states that had this expansion are California, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Oregon, and Washington. Another area of equal import is the limiting of the affirmative defense against pay discrimination. As you may recall, I mentioned um, there was that fourth differential, that uh, fourth factor that was, you know, you, you can justify pay discrimination for any factor other than sex. That's that fourth differential, and that's where the biggest gap in enforcement was. Um, so what these numerous states did, starting around 2016, um, these states uh, went ahead and limited it so that that fourth factor isn't just any factor, but it has to be a factor that is, um, you know, sort of a bona fide factor. It's job related and consistent with a business necessity or other kind of similar limitations. So it's not just some arbitrary factor, but there is a real legitimate reason for that. Another area is salary history bans, where employers can't ask job applicants um, uh, what they were getting paid in the prior job. And the theory of that being, if you were discriminated in your former job, but your new employer gets to ask you what you got paid and use that as a platform to negotiate a new salary, you're just kind of perpetuating that pay discrimination. So you kind of started a clean slate with each new employer. That's a salary history ban. You know, you look at it fairly sizable portion of uh, the states that have already adopted it. And this has really been just going on the last few years, as I had mentioned. There's also equal safe uh, pay, equal pay safe harbors. And there's three states, Massachusetts, Oregon, and Colorado, and of varying uh, value. Uh, Massachusetts probably being the most comprehensive, where they actually allow for a complete defense of the state claims for pay discrimination. And what, that, what the basic guts of it is, if you conduct a pay equity audit and you make reasonable progress towards that, notably progress, not actually achieving pay equity, but making progress toward it, you can use that as a, uh, a uh, as a defense uh, for an actual pay discrimination. So for example, you're in Massachusetts, you employ a number of employees, one of them claims that you were engaged in pay discrimination, uh, they conduct a pay equity audit as part of the litigation, shows that there, there is pay discrimination, but you can show that you conducted a uh, pay equity audit and you were making quote unquote reasonable progress towards it. Uh, it doesn't matter that there was pay discrimination. That is a, a affirmative defense. So that's, you know, of significant value. Okay, next slide. Other trends that have been going on the last few years is this increased emphasis on pay transparency, uh, where basically, you know, the sort of disclosure to the public of your pay. Um, there's that aspect. There's also a diversity, that DEI um, that I had mentioned overlay on top of pay discrimination. California is the first. Um, just two years ago, they had required gender diversity uh, inside a uh, board of directors for publicly traded companies. And then more recently, uh, starting last year, uh, went into effect last year, where there's been, uh, you know, also a uh, uh, diversity required to uh, include underrepresented communities. So, you know, basically there's all these sort of pieces going on um, uh, that just really just over the last few years really pushing to um, find some level of pay, you know, to improve pay equity and that reduce that pay gap. So if you look at the chart over on the right, you can see uh, nationally sort of where generally speaking, where there's uh, additional state protection for pay equity, um, you know, uh, pay equity, other than, you know, the federal sort of framework, as I would mentioned, has been going on since, you know, that's been in effect since the 60s, and yet we still have the, these pay gaps. So uh, what you see is the lighter blue states have become more proactive in doing more than just relying on federal law. And this is from the U.S. Department of Labor uh, website. Now, uh, a further area in the sort of trends for pay equity is California is the first state to require pay data reporting. That is what we're talking about in terms of the nuts and bolts today. There's a question as to whether or not other states will follow. Interestingly, in, in California uh, adopting SB 973, that's California pay data reporting, there was kind of a competing bill that uh, was uh, submitted and it essentially died. Um, that one was the UK shaming model. 
uh, the one that followed, uh, that actually got effectuated, SB973, is more of the EEO1 component to reporting model. Okay, next slide. So what is SB973? Well, um, it is California pay data reporting, and the people who are affected are private employers with 100 or more employees who are required to file an annual EEO-1 report and have at least one employee in California. That's a really big deal, have at least one employee. So in order to meet that 100 employee threshold, um, it doesn't matter if you have 99 employees who report outside of California who, uh, who are outside of California and report to uh, an establishment outside of California. If you've just got one employee that is in California or report, uh, re is assigned to a California location, that's you're on the hook. So that's a big deal. Um, and these, that clarification was provided by the Department of Air Employment and Housing, the DFEH, Win 3. The statute, it really just, you know, it wasn't very clear exactly what was going on in terms of who had to report. But the DFEH made it very clear that um, as long as you got one employee in California, you, if you hit the 100 employee threshold, you're on the hook. Now, when is the deadline? It's really soon. That's March 31st. This annual California pay data reporting is due every year, um, and the deadline is March 31st. Another thing to, you know, that a, a lot of people may trip up on is, um, you know, how is the 100 employee threshold calculated? Well, there's two ways to calculate it. There's the snapshot period. That's basically a, a pay period in the fourth quarter. Um, if you have, if you as an employer employed at least 100 employees uh, in a snapshot period, um, you can be on the hook. Alternatively, if you quote unquote regularly employ 100 or more employees during the reporting year, you're on the hook. In other words, it's not, well, I'm good because want the snapshot I'm in, um, I don't have any, uh, I, I don't hit the 100. You got to show that you, you don't fall under either one. That's important. Now, uh, another nuance that's also important is if you're part of like a multi-organizational uh, you know, environment. So if you are part of a single enterprise and what that means is affiliated companies with centralized ownership, control, or management. Um, if you're part of a single enterprise and you collectively work, uh, employ more than 100 employees, you're going to be subject to, um, uh, you're going to be subject to SB 973. So there's a lot of ways to get hooked to SB 973. It's very broad. Um, and indeed, um, all employees are included, whether they're paid uh, part-time or full-time, whether they're on paid or unpaid leaves. It's very, very broad. Um, also, temporary workers, when you're counting this 100 employee, um, so temporary workers provided by a staffing agency or independent contractor are included if they fall within the definition of the employee for uh, of quote unquote employee for purposes of SB 973 which means an individual um, on an employer's payroll whom the employer is required to include in an EEO 1 report and for whom the employer is required to withhold federal social security taxes from that individual wages. So it's a very specific definition. If you fall within that definition, you're an employee regardless of what label uh, the employer has uh, has put on you. So, um, okay, so next slide. So what, okay, so let's say you are now, um, you know, you figured out that you are subject to SB 973. Well, what are you going to be reporting? Well, as I've mentioned, it's modeled after the EEO-1 component to reporting. It's going to require gender, race, and ethnicity, pay, uh, hours work data across 10 job categories. Uh, importantly, employers can satisfy the 973 obligation by submitting um, the EEO-1 component to report to the DFEH. However, in the most recent update, they uh, noted that you know they have endeavored to uh, follow the EEO-1 component to reporting as much as possible. Um, 
but because there are differences, you know, to the extent that that report doesn't have all the pieces, you're going to have to um, submit it. You're going to have to add to that. So, you know, the, the bottom line is this is a significant new and compliance obligation to track and report pay and demographics data and hours uh, work data. Uh, while the full extent of enforcement has yet to be def uh, determined, the law expressly aims to, among other things, to investigate and prosecute complaints uh, alleging uh, and uh, bringing civil uh, actions pursuant to the California Equal Pay Act. And that's California's uh, basically the law against pay discrimination. Uh, one thing I, you know, I kind of alluded to and I want to kind of emphasize this point is remote workers can be included. California-based uh, teleworkers must be included in the reports. Additionally, remote workers outside like California but who report to California establishments must be included in the reports. So, you know, where there's sort of this nexus with California, those are the ones you're going to report on. Okay, importantly, an employer is not required to include in the report uh, establishments outside of California with no California employees. Um, in the case of multi-establishments, an employer is supposed to submit a report for all establishments in one single report. There was, you know, some fluctuation, like the DFEH website um, provided um, guidance for how to submit um, the California pay data report. It was, you know, in flux and they were constantly adding new updates. And as they were updating, originally they were going to require a report for each establishment along with a consolidated report for multi-establishment employers. However, they've changed that and now an employer must submit one report for all establishments in that one single report. Okay, next slide. Now I wanted to talk to you about confidentiality because by statute it specifically says that quote unquote individually identified identifiable information, what a lot of people sort of think about as PII or personally identified information. That data in the annual pay data reports is considered confidential and not subject to disclosure. Um, that said, that DFEH, um, you know, by statute will maintain these reports for at least 10 years and they are entitled to publish the data in kind of aggregated reports where, you know, the actual identities of the person or the business that the data is associated with can't be identified, but, you know, just kind of, a de you know, sort of scrubbed reports that give kind of, you know, sort of big volume data without necessarily identifying where that data came from. Now, the Division of Labor Standards Enforcement, DLSE, may use information from the pay data reports as needed upon instituting an investigation or enforcement proceeding under the California Pay Equal Pay Act. So there's a little asterisk on the confidentiality uh, of this information. And really importantly, if a former employee, for example, is alleging pay discrimination, they could potentially seek a copy of these reports from their employer and or potentially subpoena the reports from the DFEH. Okay, next slide. So as I mentioned, the DFEH is the uh, agency charged with implementing and enforcing this SB 973 annual pay data reporting. And they can seek an order to compel an employer to comply and be entitled to costs associated with seeking the order for compliance. Now, very importantly, the DFEH can obtain from the EDD the names and addresses of all businesses with 100 or more employees to ensure compliance with it. So they're going to know broadly speaking, who should be submitting the reports. You don't want the DFEH come and knock in and then try to seek an order to compel you to do it and then you have to pay the cost for that. That's not a good way to go. Uh, the DFEH has authority including subpoenas, interrogatories, depositions, and document requests to seek a court order to compel compliance and the DLSE and the DFEH together will adopt procedures to ensure they're sort of coordinating activities to enforce the California Pay Act. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mark Dwyer, who's going to talk about really just the nuts and bolts uh, uh, of SB973 and what the data reveals. Mark? Great. Uh, thank you, Joanna. And welcome again, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, just started to dig into this a little bit uh, deeper in some respects. Uh, the California DFEH, what we're using is the acronym, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. 
has an active website, uh, which is listed here, and has an, a lot of materials, including a 68-page user guide. Uh, so uh, there's, there's a lot of material. Uh, we're in the remainder of the webinar, or in this next section at least, we'll cover some of the essentials, but obviously won't be able to cover all the details. As Joanna noted, uh, it's very, the, the filing requirements are very similar to EE1 Component 2 filing from uh, last year. But there are some differences. Uh, so what are those differences? Well, uh, as of Monday, uh, when there was a, a big update, you are not uh, required to necessarily file in a comma separated uh, va value format, a CSV format. You can also file in Excel. So there's uh, some uh, added flexibility there. Unlike the earlier EEO1 reports, um, the reporting, file, reporting for SB973 has two sections. It has a first, an, an employer section, which summarizes things uh, on how the entity is listed in, uh, with the uh, California Employment uh, Development Department, the EDD, and that's because they're cross-referencing that. Um, it, it picks up your total number of employees overall and in California as well as the number of establishments. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that first section. It's uh, pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the DFEH has indicated that they'll cross-reference, as I just mentioned, to the EDD, the Employment Development Department, so it's important to accurately report how you are identified by the EDD, so they can make sure that they've got you checked off uh, properly. But our focus today is going to be on the second section of the filing, which, is re re which they call the Establishment and Employee Section, Section 2 of the report, uh, which is actually where you you'll be providing your pay and hours uh, reporting uh, data. Some background, the contractor who's managing this is NORC, which was the same contractor that managed the uh, component two for the EEOC. And if I haven't mentioned it already, uh, we've got the non-binary gender as a wedge between the component two filing and the California SB 973 filing. Uh, you'd have to break out your uh, workforce to, to account for non-binary genders. As, as well. Uh, then there's a certain type of filing, a very summary, uh, simple filing that was available under EEO1 fi filings. It's not available here. Here you have to list the same details for all of your establishments, regardless of their size. Um, what else? Uh, we're using a different definition of, of uh, compensation. We're using a broader definition, uh, or SB, uh, the, the DFEH is under box, it's the box five uh, measure under uh, the W2, not uh, the, uh, the box one. And then the, another important difference, which again uh, makes the, even though there was an aspiration, aspiration on the part of DFEH to make the compo um, component two filing uh, an acceptable submission, and maybe if it comes back, it will, will be, we'll have to see there's a difference in the hours definition. So paid time off is included in hours here where it was excluded explicitly under component two. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, so just to uh, touch on this briefly, uh, Joanna mentioned that there are these 10 job categories and it's worth noting, you're, you're breaking your labor force, your, your uh, submission up, uh, your employees up into these 10 job categories, the same ones that the EEOC uses. Uh, it's, it's worth noting that these are the only measures that you're able to submit that differentiate employees by skill, effort, responsibility, or working conditions. Okay, so this is, this is it. So uh, you want to make sure that you are as accurate as possible in this. Uh, employees in one of these job categories will be compared to one another. And so, uh, uh, for instance, just because a job title includes the term manager or director or, or something similar does not mean that that employee manages people. And you probably don't want to put them into the manager, uh, mid-level officials and managers section unless they're actually in a manage, have, have management responsibility. Conversely, job titles that may not use those, those terms uh, may, be, may be for people with management responsibility. So getting that right and, and trying to get people that you that are going to be, these people are going to be compared to one another within these groups. And so you want to make sure you keep that in mind when you're um, 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 trying to get this as accurate as possible. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so as we mentioned, um, in addition to the job categories, uh, SB 973 is, is, has limited controls for, legitimate controls for, for variation in, in uh, compensation. So th those include location and hours worked, <clears throat> that, that's it. Um, other, other legitimate business factors that are affecting pay that are legitimate drivers of pay differences are not, are not captured. Uh, there's a question that uh, I, I, uh, came up um, uh, uh, during jo uh, Joanna's section and uh, 
the question was, does the employer, employer need to be based in California? And no, they do not. I think, I think um, to address that, I just want to emphasize that as long as you have an employee working in California, you're, you're uh, subject to these requirements, these reporting requirements. The um, guidance that, they, that the uh, DFEH offers explicitly indicates that re reporting requirements count 100, or the, the, the 100 employee requirement is for US employees. That's uh, in response to another question. So e employees outside the US may not necessarily be counted, um, but uh, be because of that uh, language. Um, I would also note that SB 973 only applies to employers who are required to file EEO-1 reports. So that typically are, are employers with 100 more employees or federal contractors and subcontractors with 50 or more employees. So if you happen to be an employer with <clears throat> who's a federal contractor with most of your employees outside the US, there might be some gray area here. But um, if you have any um, em um, employees, uh, so, sorry, so there might be some, some gray area there, but even if you have employees in California. Um, on the hour side, uh, I would emphasize um, that these are annual hours for all employees. That what you're reporting is a total hours number. Okay, so it's all hours worked on an annual basis for all the employees of a given gender and race ethnicity within a job category and establishment in pay band. So it's, it's, it's a group of employees and you're giving a total hours number for that. And we'll see that in just a minute. There was a question asked as to whether there was any restriction on whether the hours uh, provided could be um, fractions of an hour. And of course, I, I don't see any restriction on, on that, uh, but since you're talking about annual hours for multiple employees, it's not gonna make a big difference one way or the other, li likely, but um, I don't see any restriction to hold whole number of hours. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, <clears throat> so the, um, the, in addition to breaking the data up by uh, establishment and by job category, it's broken up by these annual pay bands, 12 annual pay bands. Um, these are based on the same bands that were used in component two and are defined by the US Bureau of Labor and Statistics um, in the Occupational Employment Statistics Survey. A couple of uh, guiding points here. The, de the definition of annual compensation is again different like we mentioned just a moment ago. Um, there's no annualizing of wages. It's just the wages that are on that W-2. So if someone started mid-year or, or a month ago, it's, it's, what's, on, it's, it's what the, what's on the W-2. You don't, uh, you don't expand that to, into an implied annual measure. Since you're reporting hours, that's going to help um, uh, uh, you know, control for that. But we'll see that it doesn't do a great job. Um, uh, so the results are going to show for each job classification establishment, the number of employees in each pay band by gender and race ethnicity, uh, uh, and, and it'll show their, uh, uh, their, hour, their total hours worked. <clears throat> okay, um, the key takeaways here are that employers are reporting pay and hours for employees identified in a particular pay period. Okay, regardless of whether they're current employees or not. So when you get that snapshot period uh, from October through December last year, you're going to be um, looking at a particular set of employees, whether or not they're still with your company. Pay is reported in 12 annual pay bands <clears throat> and annual hours include paid time off. So those, those are some of the key takeaways here. Let's move to uh, what the, a template that they've provided. So we can see actually what they have in mind here. That's our next slide. Okay. So, um, you can see here uh, that the section two that where the hours and pay are reported has two sections, a, a light green header and a darker green header. The left side is the establishment information. So this is showing the, the name of the establishment, uh, the address, uh, what, what its activity is and the total number of employees uh, and whether an EEO one uh, report was filed or not. And then on the right hand side, uh, we've got the, the pay and hours data, okay? so. Uh, the, first uh, the first column there on, under N is the job category, okay, one of, one of those uh, 10 job categories. The next are the race, eth eth ethnicity, and sex uh, designations, which are uh, alphanumeric codes. There, uh, there are 21 of those. Then we have the, the, uh, the pay bands, the 1 through 12 pay bands. Then, then we have the employee count that fit those, those, that description by job category, race, ethnicity, sex, and pay band. And then we have that total hours amount. You can see that these numbers are gonna be typically, you know, pretty, you know, like on the order of thousands or tens of thousands of, tens of thousands. <clears throat> okay, um, so let's see here. Uh, right, uh, the um, one, one point to note here is that lower salary pay bands 
uh, may reflect recent hires and part-time workers because it's, again, what's just on the W-2. Higher salary groups may include workers with significant overtime. And since gender is broken into three components, male, female, and non-binary, uh, race, ethnicity follows into, falls into seven values. The combination of those gives us 21 of these alphanumeric codes. Uh, Okay, uh, and then another key point here is that you are able to make fairly granular comments. Okay, so you're able to, there is a, there is a uh, provision for uh, clarifying comments at this level of specificity. So for a particular gender, race, ethnicity, in a particular job category, uh, and for a particular establishment. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> So what I um, did here was just sort of work through, I wanted to work through a couple of the mechanics here of um, how the pay data uh, is likely to be uh, assessed. Um, so in this example, I, it's, it's all fictitious data, but I, I used the template created uh, by DFEH. We've got the establishment information on the left-hand side, the employee information on the right-hand side. This is, this is an establishment with three locations. I've highlighted in the middle rows here that the headquarters, which is a, which is also identified by column the question in column M, so that's the that's the headquarters, and this is like a car sales, um, you know, example uh, of a place that sells cars, and so what I've highlighted on the right hand side at the employee level are in boxes are the sales workers. So these the two the headquarters doesn't have any uh, sales workers in this example, but these two uh, locations do. And we're going to be looking at those uh, in a little bit more de detail just to show, okay, so, uh, just to sh work sh through some of the examples here, right? So we have sales workers are broken up by race, ethnicity, and sex by pay band. Then we have the employee counts and their total hours. So let's see how, how this might be analyzed uh, in the next slide. <clears throat> Okay, so what we have here is just a distillation of what we were just looking at for sales workers across those two establishments, across those two car lots you, you, you could think of. Okay, so they're added up and, and we have the uh, alphanumeric codes for different gender, race, uh, ethnicity, and sexes across the top. And then we have the pay bands. And you can see here that we have some pretty wide variations uh, in, in annual compensation pay bands here, right, across these different groups. Looking, looking at it, it looks as though, um, so, so one, one um, measure that uh, can be made here is a weighted average compensation measure. What's the weighted average pay band by gender, race, ethnicity, and sex, okay? So you look at that and we see that B10 and B30 seem to be higher, significantly higher wage bands than anybody else. Um, so what's, what's going on here? Well, most likely this is due to different start and end dates, okay? And in fact, um, th these data were constructed so that the workers in the first four categories, A10 through B20, are all being paid the same hourly wage rate, okay? But they're coming in to work or, or they stopped working uh, mid-year or they're working part-time, their hours are different, and so that's putting them into different salary bands. Okay, um, so right off the bat, just looking at it from an annual perspective, you can see that uh, there can be the perception that there's some substantial pay differences which are which are due to hours. Well, so we, we think, okay, well, at least we submitted our hours, so maybe that's going to solve this, and DFEH won't be on us because of this, of what appears to be annual compensation variation, right? So that brings us to the next slide. So in this, in this next slide, uh, we basically use the hours for each group to construct an average wage based on the different, different pay bands, okay? And what you see here is because of the, the um, discreteness, the, the lumpiness of the pay bands, they, they ver typically vary by about 27 to 25% from the bottom to the top of the pay band, you still get substantial implied hourly wage variation. And again, for the first four categories, that's not real. Okay, they're actually all being paid the same wage. But when DFEH attempts to, to make a wage measure, attempts to use the hours that they've collected to control for differences in, in hours and to come up with a, a, a more standardized measure of compensation, they're still gonna see or, or, or may see substantial wage variation. Okay, 26%, 14%, 17% relative to the high wage group in, in A10 or quote unquote high, high wage group. Again, A10, 20, B10 and B20 are all paid the same. So um, what this slide is, is trying to demonstrate is that the coarseness of the pay bands and the, and this, the simplifications and the reporting requirements uh, 
means that there, there are going to be inevitable distortions created. And this is without controlling for anything more than these 10 broad pay bands. There's a lot of more, there are many more reasons, many more um, factors that can go into con uh, effort measures of skill, effort, responsibility, and working conditions that are not captured by those 10 job categories. So uh, it's worthwhile having a look at these numbers, having, having a run at them ahead of time, and being able to explain or offer uh, comments as to why these variations are uh, figments. They're not, they're not legitimate. And at the same time, there, there's situations like with B30, C20, and C40, where there are differences in skill, effort, responsibility, and different wages are, are being paid to those, those employees. And it's important to be able to document those reasons too. Again, because they're not going to be reflected in this big, broad group of sa comparing sales workers. Um, okay, so that's just a couple of examples at a, at a very simple level of, of uh, implicit distortions or, or inevitable distortions in, in, the, in the structure of the, of the pay data collection. So which, what should employers do? Let's, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay. Pay, pay, what does the pay, reported pay data mean? Uh, DFAEH is, is uh, emphasized or indicated that they're going to be making comparisons between uh, companies in the same industry. Again, there's almost no accounting for the four legitimate business, pay, business factors permissible under federal law and the California Equal Pay Act, uh, skill, effort, responsibility, and working conditions. Um, and we're only approximating pay gaps <laughs> even. We're not even measuring raw pay gaps, actually, because of the, of the coarseness of the pay bands. Most likely, um, it'll be made, be made to you, uh, the DFEH will use this, these data to make comparisons uh, with across your establishments to see if there are any differences across establishments and then across comparing your company to others in a similar industry. Again, this, this emphasizes making use of the comments section as a preemptive defense, but this requires you to have accurate information to provide to the DFEH. And this is where a pay equity audit comes in. A pay equity audit identifies pay variation due to legitimate business factors and that pay variation, which may not be due or not documentable to, to such factors. This additional pay variation can systematically, if unintentionally, affect certain protected classes. Okay, so if there's, if there's parts of your pay variation that you can't explain, you know, itself, that's not a big deal. It's a big deal when it aligns with a gender or a race ethnicity. Um, so some of the sources of that subjective or, incon or, or inconsistency in compensation decisions can arise from delegating comp compensation decisions to multiple compensation authorities, multiple managers throughout an organization, changes in compensation authorities over time, and a lack of complete documentation regarding how compensation was set. That, the pay equity audit helps you identify and address these uh, sources of sub subjectivity and inconsistency. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that brings us to a uh, pay equity audit. <clears throat> so this is an analysis of your, work, of your workforce. It identifies pay disparities that are potential liabilities, not just the raw pay gaps by placing statistical weights for the legitimate bus business factors that you identify, okay, that you, have, that you, that you track and, and have identified. And this defensive, this, that defensively reduced the raw pay gaps revealed under SB 973. The pay equity audit establishes the relevance of legitimate business factors to explaining pay differences and can help provide context for your SB 973 filing. So it helps you fill in those um, uh, clarifying comments. It quantifies risks, helps to devise the right remediation strategy and tracks progress. Uh, it's privileged, <clears throat> okay, or can be. Um, you, we, uh, a pay equity audit should provide you, you and your in-house or external counsel the mechanisms to maintain privilege, uh, so that the degree of transparency that an employer provides regarding the pay equity audit is a separate choice. Uh, another element of a pay equity audit is that it provides information about root causes. For instance, are there commonalities of location, position, or uh, hiring, hiring cohort when, when uh, uh, employees were hired that aligns with, with uh, uh, pay disparities? Or are and are pay disparities as evident among recent hires as they are among retained employees? Is there a difference um, between employees that have been with the company for some time? Pay equity audits should try to address those issues too. Uh, in addition to that, pay equity audits should, should and, and uh, give you information about remediation strategies. What kind of pay adjustments, what, uh, pay adjustments are, are 
and, and that, that extends to pay, pay adjustments, but that's only one strategy. There are many other strategies, such as addressing root causes of pay disparities and identifying any missing information related to legitimate business factors that would further explain compensation dis decisions. Another final piece of a pay equity audit is identifying systemic business factor differences between protected classes. So for example, are there systematic differences in tenure with a company or in managerial responsibility between different races and ethnicities or different genders? If so, those differences may be hurting diversity and inclusion efforts. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So a pay equity audit uh, uses analytical techniques that are the same, uh, have the same foundation of those that are used in, in litigation. It employs statistical techniques for determining how legitimate business factors influence compensation. These out, out, uh, underlie litigation outcomes, both in terms of the evidence for or against allegations and in terms of remedies. These three cases, SystemX, Uber, and Western Digital, are just a few examples of the use of statistical analysis of wage data as evidence related to wage discrimination and in the determination of relief of wage discrimination in, in wage discrimination settlements. System X demonstrates that the analytics of a pay equity audit can provide advanced warning of vulnerability to pay discrimination claims that would not easily be dismissed. And the Uber and Western Digital uh, uh, cases re, uh, were ones in which remediation measures gra grounded in pay equity analytic were, were grounded in pay equity analytics and ongoing monitoring <clears throat> that, that a pay equity audit solution should provide. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so organizations, we have a, a looming deadline here in March, and there's a lot of room for, for uh, uh, clarifying comments, but you need to know what to put in those clarifying comments. Organizations should be proactive and get started right now. Here are a few uh, motivating uh, uh, quotes. Um, there are risks and costs to action, but, but they are far less than the long range risks of comfortable inaction. In any moment of decision, the best thing you might do is the right thing. The next best thing to do is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is do nothing. And that's particularly true in handing over your pay data and your hours data to um, state regulators. One sometimes encounters employers who think they're better off not knowing about what pay differences they may have, but this is not going to be the case. It's up to the employer uh, to know how to respond to the results of this. It's up to the employer how to respond to a pay equity audit and the degree to which those results are kept confidential. So it need, it need not be public, public information. Again, one wants to be able to offer responses to California regulators and, and being able to do so requires knowing what, the, what your pay equity situation is. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So that brings us uh, just to an example of a pay equity audit solution that fills those requirements that I, I mentioned er earlier. Uh, TrueZeg's pay parity uh, DE and I monthly monitoring solution provides you with the insights you need to meet the challenges posed by California's new pay data reporting requirements. In addition to pay data reporting, Pay, pay parity DEI provides employers with analytically grounded measures of pay equity, workforce diversity, and employee sense of inclusion. So the D, every element, diversity, um, equity, and inclusion. Through monthly monitoring, pay parity DEI goes beyond simple one-time measures by tracking and identifying trends in diversity, equity, and inclusion measures as your workforce and compensation philosophy evolve over time. Pay parity DEI also provides you an assessment of underlying issues, giving rise to, to discrepancies in those three dimensions, along with strategies, solutions, and advice for addressing those discrepancies. Pay parity DEI combines the best of easy to use and interpret software and, consult, and, a, and a consultative solution, reflecting the three, area, three areas of expertise, data cleaning, analytics, and regulatory uh, requirement expertise. Okay, um, so that brings us to our final slide, uh, which is to ask for any questions. And with this, I'd also uh, like to launch a, a, an interactive question. Would you like a free demo of the Trusaic Pay Parity de and monthly monitoring solution? If so, just uh, all you need to do is answer yes to this uh, pop-up. Joanna, do we have any questions that we might be able to address? We do. We have a, a lot of questions. And so one of the things we're going to do is, um, you know, after the webinar, we're going to go through and uh, basically go through all the questions and provide written responses. I think we're just going to have time for just a couple of the questions. Um, one question is, do you know of any payroll providers that track this information? And I can answer this one. Um, 
Some payroll providers have indicated they provide SB 973 reporting. I mean, the key is you're going to want to do some due diligence to make sure they have the capability to do it. Um, you know, this is new. So, um, you know, just because they do payroll doesn't mean they necessarily are going to be able to do SB 973 reporting. Not all the data required for these reports resides in a payroll company's database. They're still going to have to reconcile the data with other data elements to complete the reporting. You also want to see, you know, what capability they have of conducting a pay equity audit analysis so you know um, what the data implies about your pay gaps. And again, you know, these are sort of rough, raw numbers that really could paint um, a pay discrimination picture where really there isn't one. So you want to be able to conduct the pay equity audit in conjunction with the SB 973 reporting. Um, another question, um, Mark, I'll give this to you, is uh, what is the meaning of an establishment? So uh, that, that's a good question, and that uh, it has, has evolved or is evolving. Uh, there's some explicit guides on that. The, in this first year, um, uh, DFEH is following the definition of, of establishment that's used by the EEO1, which is primarily a, 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 lo a lo location-based uh, definition of establishment. They have a, a broader, more conceptual notion of establishment that they want to migrate to, but for uh, this first reporting year, it's the same uh, definition of establishment, which is a, a business location uh, that the uh, EEOC is using. Oh, thank you, Mark. Um, the actual uh, definition that eventually they're going to migrate to for, uh, for the audience, it's, quote, uh, an economic unit producing goods or services, close quote. So that's ultimately what they're going to migrate to. But for now, they're providing a more you know, user-friendly, uh, you know, obvious definition. Okay, another question. Um, actually, I've seen a number of questions kind of dealing with the question of what happens when you have employees um, that report outside of California. Um, so just to kind of answer all of those kind of broadly, when we're considering employees, there's sort of two types of employees you need to consider. One is for the reporting purposes. You know, obviously, employers, employees in California. It doesn't matter whether the employer is outside of California or not. It's employees in California. That's the first type of employee you need to report on. The second type of employee is an employee outside of California, but only if that person is assigned to a California establishment. So that's the rub. So, you know, there were some questions kind of dealing with, is it outside the U.S.? Well, it, you know, the DFEH guidance is silent on it, and there's no limitation that it needs to be the U.S. So, it, you know, uh, to be safe, you're going to want to include all employees that are assigned to a California establishment. Um, so that's, hopefully that clarifies that. And uh, again, I will be answering, uh, we'll be answering all questions in written form, uh, but for purposes of, uh, you know, sort of generally speaking, uh, if you're outside of California and you're assigned to a California establishment, you're going to be reporting uh, on those employees. Another kind of group of questions that we got were, um, you know, I think captured by uh, one question that specifically asked, um, hold on, just give me one second, I can't find it now. Um, oh, sorry, it's the same question. Uh, what type of employers uh, are subject to SB 973? That sort of captures the nature of that. So like, you know, are nonprofits included? Well, to answer that question, SB 973 is not sort of segregated by particular industries. If you are required to file a federal EEO-1 report, um, you're going to be potentially subject to SB 973. If you are not required to file a federal EEO-1 report, then you aren't subject to it. And so in a way, that implicitly identifies certain industries that are not included. So for example, um, a public secondary school is not subject to EEO-1 reporting, so such schools would be exempt from California pay data reporting. So, you know, broadly speaking, it's, there are no, you know, ex, uh, exemptions. It's based on what's quote-unquote a private employer. So if you fit within that definition, you're potentially subject to it. If you are not a private employer, you are not subject to it. And implicit in the SB 973 um, 
uh, guidance if you aren't filing a federal EEO-1 report because you're in a certain industry, if you will, um, or category, um, you are exempt from that. But that's really the only exemption. And as we are uh, almost exactly at the um, hour mark, um, let me turn it over back to HR.com. Thank you. This concludes our webcast today. I would like to thank our presenters as well as all of you for joining us. If you would like to view this webcast again, the recording and slides will be available in the HR.com archives. The webcast credit will show in your account within two business days, and we will also send an email with the credit information. Your feedback is important to us. Please take a moment and fill out the exit survey. This concludes the webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.